Hi everyone, this is Dr. Hall, and I'm going to go through some of the histology of the digestive system with you in this brief video. So first of all, when we think about the digestive tract and when we think about the alimentary canal in general, remember it's this long continuous tube that starts in the pharynx and then ends at the anus. And there are several features that we're going to find in all different portions of this alimentary canal. The first is the mucosa. The mucosa is this innermost lining of the inside of the tube. The very inside of the tube, which is the open space that the food is going to move through, is called the lumen. There we go. So, and then we have the mucosa, and then just deep to the mucosa, which is this region here, is the submucosa, because it's underneath the mucosa, and that's an area of connective tissue. Moving outward from there, we have the muscularis externa. This is this muscle layer, smooth muscle, because this is of the viscera. This is the muscle that's going to do peristalsis for us. There is an inner circular layer where the fiber direction is like this. So when it contracts, it kind of squeezes and pinches off an area. And then we have an outer longitudinal with fiber direction running lengthwise that kind of scunches up the tube as we go. So we have the lumen on the inside, mucosa, then submucosa, then muscularis, and around everything else around the outtime is the serosa, which is just a thin membrane of connective tissue much of the time, uh, and also the visceral peritoneum, which, if we're in the small intestine, will continue into the mesentery. So that's the general organization of the entire alimentary canal or digestive tract. Here is an example of what that looks like under the microscope. So this happens to be a region of the stomach. You can see the lumen here, right? That hole in the middle, that's what the, where the food's going to be. Here's our mucosa. Then we have submucosa right here. And then we have the muscular layer. And then the outermost layer is the serosa, that connective tissue. So we're going to find that same repeating pattern all throughout the alimentary canal. Let's start with the esophagus. So here is an image that doesn't show you the entirety of the esophagus. Here is the lumen here. Here is our mucosa. The mucosa in the esophagus is composed of our old friend, stratified squamous epithelium. And we're super glad that it is because we recall that stratified squamous epithelium has multiple, multiple layers of cells on top of each other. They're so tiny you can't see them, but many, many tiny layers of cells all on top of each other. And all the blood vessels and nerves are down here in the submucosa. So what this means is that this tissue is very resilient. I can eat crunchy sharp shards of potato chip and not end up bleeding from it because this is very durable and resilient. Many cell layers thick before you get to nerve, nerve endings and blood vessels. So let's take a look at some other images of the esophagus. Here's one where we can see it in its entirety. We have the lumen here in the middle, and there's nothing in the esophagus, so it's kind of a little squiggly and collapsed. Here is our mucosa right here, which is our stratified squamous epithelium. Here's the submucosa, which is connective tissue and glands. And then here is the muscularis externa, which has two different muscle layers in it. And the outermost layer of connective tissue is our serosa. If we look at higher magnification, again, here's the mucosa. This is our stratified squamous epithelium. If we look even higher magnification, we can see those the nuclei of those individual cells quite well. And remember that by the time they get to the top, they are those flat kind of fried egg-like shaped cells. And so that's why it's called stratified squamous. Here's another uh, histogram of stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. This is what it looks like underneath the microscope at low power and at the 40x. 
moving into the stomach, which you'll recall is a little bit different because it has three muscle layers, an outer longitudinal, deep to that a circular, and then an innermost oblique, which is different. So that allows it to churn the food. The stomach is also different in terms of the structure of its mucosa. So instead of stratified squamous epithelium now, we're going to have simple columnar. I think you can appreciate these single continuous layers of columnar cells. And they dive down and form these pits. These gastric pits are where gastric juices are going to be produced. Here's another image of the stomach. And you can see here, down in here, are these gastric pits. Here's a low magnification view, so you can see all of the layers. We've got our lumen here in the middle. Here is our mucosa, so this is our um, simple columnar epithelium diving down into those gastric pits. Submucosa is the connective tissue deep to the mucosa and then our muscularis externa. And you'll remember in the stomach, we have three layers of smooth muscles. So outer longitudinal layer, these cells are coming out toward us. In uh, middle circular layer for the stomach, so these are running this direction. So it's what we're used to seeing for smooth muscle. And then the oblique layer, which are kind of diagonal. We take a closer look in, we can again see those gastric pits here where things dive down in. What we can't see very well on this slide are the goblet cells that produce mucus, which are a really important defense for the stomach against the acid that it secretes. Moving into the small intestine, we're going to see a new feature, which is villi. These are finger-like projections of the mucosa and some of the submucosa. There's one, here's another, here's another, there's another. These serve to help increase the surface area in the small intestine to facilitate digestion and absorption. So again, we have mucosa, submucosa, and our muscular layers, outer longitudinal and inner circular, and the serosa, which is the connective tissue around the outside. Here are another couple of images. This one on the right, they simply used a different stain. That's why we're seeing different colors. Here's your muscularis externa, submucosa, mucosa with your villi. And on the left, we have a close-up of a villus. And so each one of these little tiny circles are individual nuclei of simple columnar epithelial cells. You can see these clear circles of goblet cells which are producing mucus. And on the inside of the villus, we are going to find this area in here is where we're going to find the capillary and the lacteal on the inside of the vill each villus. Another image, this is from one of the slides in our lab. So again, you can see the mucosa with these finger-like projections called villi, submucosa, and the muscularis externa. And if we zoom in for a close-up of the muscularis externa, again, we see that inner circular level where, you know, like here's an individual smooth muscle cell, here's another one, right, oriented in that direction. And then the outer longitudinal layer where they're actually coming out toward us. Another example, this time with a bit of a close-up on a villus. And you can see these individual simple columnar epithelial cells. You can see the goblet cells. And another close-up. Again, here's a goblet cell. This is our simple columnar epithelium lining each individual villus and a very high magnification where we can see the microvilli also called the brush border. These are little extensions on the top of each of the simple columnar epithelial cells that serve to further increase surface area to facilitate absorption. Also, the microvilli or the brush border contain enzymes to help break nutrients down into their basic subunits, right, down into the amino acids and glucose or other monosaccharides. 
Remind you again, on the inside of the villus, that's where we're going to find the capillary and the lacteal, which is where those nutrients, when they move into the cell, they're going to move across and then into either the capillary or the lacteal. Here's another image from our lab of simple columnar epithelium from the small intestine. On this high power view, you can see these little microvilli on the tops of each cells. Here's another example of a goblet cell. If we look at the large intestine, in many ways it looks somewhat similar to the stomach. Again, it's going to have the same three layers that everybody does. So we've got mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and out here would be the serosa, that connective tissue around the external surface. When we look in a little bit more closely, again, we can see the different orientation of the smooth muscle with those two layers. And then we see a whole lot of goblet cells in the large intestine. So the small intestine had some goblet cells, but it didn't have nearly this many. And that's because in the small intestine, the contents in the lumen, the chyme, is still very liquidy. But when we get into the large intestine, one of the jobs of the large intestine is to absorb water out of those contents. So as things move through the large intestine or the colon, the material becomes more and more solid. Therefore, we need more and more lubrication in the form of mucus to be able to move things through. So we see a lot of goblet cells in the large intestine. Finally, I wanna show you the pancreas. So the pancreas is a really interesting organ. Remember, it's that gland that's located kind of behind the stomach and also nestles in the crook of the abdomen. We have two different types of cells that we find in the pancreas reflecting its two different functions. So remember, the pancreas has an endocrine function where it makes hormones that it secretes in the bloodstream. It does that in these special little regions of cells called islets of Langerhans. That's where it produces the insulin and glucagon, the hormones that it secretes into the bloodstream for regulation of blood glucose levels from the islets of Langerhans. The rest of the pancreas is made up of these acinar cells, A-C-I-N-A-R, and those are the cells that are producing the pancreatic enzymes, such as trypsin, pancreatic lipase, pancreatic amylase, uh, nucleases that it's, that it's then going to secrete via the pancreatic duct into the duodenum. So that is the pancreas's exocrine function. Here's another example. You can see the acinar cells quite clearly on this image. Those are the cells that are producing the enzymes. That's the exocrine function. It's gonna secrete those enzymes into the duodenum. Over here, we have an islet of Langerhans. That's producing insulin and glucagon. That's the endocrine function of the pancreas. So in summary, just keep in mind that the lumen is the hole inside the tube if we're dealing with the digestive tract specifically. I should have mentioned and called out that the pancreas is not part of the alimentary canal. The food does not move through the pancreas, so it does not have these layers. It's completely different. It's an accessory organ. But for the alimentary canal, we're dealing with the lumen, the mucosa, which will be specialized for which part of the digestive tract we're in. In the esophagus, it's stratified squamous epithelium for durability and in the rest of the alimentary canal it's mostly simple columnar epithelium in the stomach we'll have gastric pits in the small intestine we have villi and microvilli in the large intestine we have a lot of goblet cells then moving out from mucosa we have submucosa muscularis externa with its inner circular and outer longitudinal layers in all regions and an additional third oblique innermost layer in the stomach. And then outside of the muscularis externa is the serosa or the connective tissue that surrounds everything else. And I forgot to put that here. So your outermost one is your serona, serosa. So I hope that was helpful. Good luck with your lab this week.